Welcome to today's RAND meeting. I am Kathy Leibowitz. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Next slide. I chair the RAC Communications Subcommittee, which is responsible for bringing you this meeting today. I think we have a great program. Next. But first, a few housekeeping items. This event is being recorded and will be posted on the RAN webpage. Attendee video and microphones are automatically muted and chat is turned off. Live captioning is on and you can submit questions by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Next. So for today's agenda, I wanna remind you that at approximately 3.30, we will transition from this meeting to join the Office for the Vice President of Research in celebrating the outstanding work of our colleagues at the UMore Staff Recognition Award, so stay tuned. We have a full schedule with presentations from OVPR, Research Development Services, and M Healthy, along with our standard updates. We also begin to explore ORSP's first 100 years. Next. And now I have the honor of introducing our MCs for today, Andrea Anderson and Linda Chadwick, who while not new to research administration are both new to ORSP. Andrea Anderson is the new Associate Director of ORSP. She joins us from the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth, where she oversaw the Office of Sponsored Programs. Andrea is a Michigan native, having grown up in Northville. She holds a bachelor's degree in professional writing from Grand Valley State and a Juris Doctor from Wayne State Law. Andrea has presented at national and regional conferences for NCURA, SRAI, and Autumn, an organization for tech transfer professionals. Andrea and her husband, Javier, enjoy watching their boys, Gabriel, age 10, and Oliver, age 6, play soccer and explore local parks as a family. Linda Chadwick is the new ORSP Assistant Director. Linda most recently served as the LSA Director of Research, Development, and Grants Review Services, and before that was the business manager for the Space Physics Research Lab for the Cygnus Project, one of the largest sponsored projects at the university. Linda holds a BS in Industrial and Operations Engineering from U of M and an MBA in Finance from Oakland University. She's also a certified research administrator. Linda has two children. Alexandra is a biochemist in Boston and Thomas is an investment banker in Chicago. In Linda's spare time, she, she Zoom chats with them, often joined by her cat, Gracie. Linda also enjoys attending dog shows with her new feet themed cookie and horseback riding with Topaz. And without further ado, I turn you over to Andrea and Linda. Hi everyone. Um, Chris, can you go to the next slide, please? One more, thank you. Um, so, oops, there we go, thank you. Um, we wanted to review with you today the org chart for ORSP. I know with Linda and I being added as kind of a new or different layer in the organization, it can be confusing about who does what between the two of us. So we thought we would take a quick look at that before we get into um, some of our more fun material. Um, so for, those of you who kind of have been around a while, you probably remember different iterations of this associate director position, but in its current form, um, I oversee the process and procedure development for the office, as well as um, internal training. And I oversee both of the project representative teams within the office, so the private and government sponsors teams. Chris, if you can go to the next slide. So my job in the office is, um, as I said, overseeing those functions, um, proposal and award management, process development, internal training, and of course, keeping Craig from losing more hair. Um, project representatives are divided into two major teams. We have government sponsors, which is led by Kathy DeWitt, our managing PR, 
and private sponsors, which is led by Patrick Woods, our other managing PR. And the two ancillary staff team members that report to me are Neil Carver, who handles all of our internal training in our office and makes sure, make sure the PRs know what the new processes and procedures are as they get rolled out. And Kate Strempeck, who is um, one of those super detail-oriented people who does an excellent job at helping us develop all of the processes and procedures and make sure that they flow well in ERPM as well as through our office and through your team. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Linda to talk a little bit about her side of the house. All right, thanks, Andrea. Uh, and ORSP, I support um, ORSP as a unit administrator, and I'm responsible for overall business management, including HR, budget activities, building operations, and similar type activities. And I also try to keep Craig's hair from getting even more gray. I have the following team members that I'm really fortunate to have supporting ORSP. The ancillary team in communications, Constance Colthorpe, um, and her and Cindy Dames partner with units and central offices to maintain and develop communications like websites, newsletters, and emails. In addition, I have Laura Dickey, um, supported by Amy Webb, who leads our metrics, our data and reporting. And what they're responsible for, they manage various levels of reporting for ORSP, including ERPM and other research reporting. And they also serve as the point of contact for central offices, units, and others for proposal and award data. And then I also have Jane Santoro as part of the ancillary team. And Jane provides frontline support for overall office operations and campus community support. Tracy Schwab leads the support staff team. And I wanted to spend just a couple um, seconds here talking about the different activities that they do. They triage, sponsor emails, they provide initial admin check for incoming proposals, they initiate awards and mod processing for the government and for some private sponsors, and they also manage the important processes of RPPR, closeout, and sponsor registrations. Chris, could you please advance? So ORSP is celebrating its 100th anniversary. And throughout this presentation, Andrea and I are going to be sharing some of the really major milestones over the last 100 years. And so I'm going to start it off. And Chris, could you please advance? So the first slide talks about our early beginnings. And the Office of Research and Sponsor Programs began through the efforts of an engineer, Mortimer Elwin Cooley. Cooley was a visionary, and by the time he was named Dean of Engineering in 1904, he had greatly strengthened that program. Cooley believed in generous doses of science, but he deemed practical experience equally essential, and he was surprised at how theoretical Michigan's engineering courses were. In order to introduce practical learning, he felt that faculty absolutely needed to undertake industry-sponsored research activities. Cooley was also concerned that U of M would miss the opportunity that other universities like MIT or the University of Pittsburgh were pursuing. Unfortunately, his early attempts to bring sponsor research to campus did not take hold. Academics and administrators who valued peer research kind of looked at, at scans at those engineers that were trying to do applied research. World War I, however, changed this perspective, both inside and outside the university. The war highlighted the need for expertise in various subjects and research on a scale that corporations could not deliver. They needed universities. In 1920, Cooley was finally successful in getting the regions and university administrative leadership to understand the need of a sponsor research office. And in October of that year, the Department of Research Engineering opened for business in East Engineering Building. Now it's East Hall. The regents felt that an advisory board needed to be established, and it was comprised of the greatest businessmen of that time in Michigan, some of whom included Henry Ford, 
Herbert Dow, W.K. Kellogg, and Joey Morton of Morton Salt. So there were a few issues when it first started. And some of the early problems that they encountered are the ones that a lot of our research encounter even today. Things like IP ownership and publication restrictions. And the creation though, by 1920 of this, 1929 of this office was a success. U of M did more industry research than any other university. And the very last picture is a picture of one of our early patents. And that patent was awarded to Benjamin Bailey, an electrical engineer who developed an early and improved single phase AC motor suitable for use in small appliances. This research was sponsored by Detroit Edison. Now, up until 1941, most research projects were from industries within the state of Michigan. This would change with the advent of World War II. World War II brought a new surge of activities and sponsored research, and the role of the federal government changed tremendously at this time. As research grew, the Department of Research also expanded and the types of research also changed. Prior to World War II, sponsored research was almost exclusively in the engineering areas. During and after the war, sponsored research though included physical sciences, which grew tremendously. And by 1948, sponsored research broadened to include not only research in engineering and the physical sciences, but also in architecture, forestry, and other fields. And so with that, um, I'd like to now go um, to introduce Jill. Um, and we'll have more um, interesting activities and milestones in Oris Peace history. But it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Jill Jividen. I have the pleasure of having worked with Jill um, for at least four or five years. Jill has worked in research administration and research development at U of M for 10 years, including the Med School, School of Information, and the Institute for Research on Women and Gender. She joined the Office of the Vice President for Research in 2019 as the Director of Research Development. Her team supports and catalyzes research, scholarship, and creative pursuits across campuses. Currently, Jill is the Vice President slash president-elect of the National Organization, Organization of Research Development Professionals, or NORDA, as well as a homeschool teacher, puppy trainer, paint by number enthusiast, and sourdough breaker, baker. And so without further ado, Jill Dividend. Thanks so much, Linda. Uh, it's great uh, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. You all know I love to talk about research development. Uh, it's been uh, almost a year and a half since I joined the Office of the Vice President for Research as the Director of Research Development. And so uh, I'm excited about this opportunity to share with you what we've built over the last year. And, and uh, not the least because I know so many of you are, are working uh, in the trenches, if you will, with your PIs and your faculty members. And when you're working in a central office, that is one of our challenges is reaching faculty members with valuable information and reminding them of the support and services that are available to them when the needs arise. So um, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, oh, Chris, did you want me to share my screen? Sure, go right ahead. Okay. Oops, can you, can you guys see it? Yep. Okay, thank you. So who are we in uh, the Research Development Office? Uh, we are situated in the Office of the Vice President for Research. Uh, I report to Nick Wigington, our Assistant Vice President for Research, and our research development in team includes Jesse Johnston, who joined us in April. Uh, Jesse is a, um, a graduate of the University of Michigan. He got his PhD here from uh, the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. Uh, and he worked in Washington, D.C. for a while as a program officer at the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as at the Smithsonian and in the Library of Congress. So Jesse has a really valuable experience, and he is overseeing research development for our units in the arts, humanities, and, uh, and social sciences areas. 
uh, most of my experiences uh, are in the STEM areas. And so I will spend most of my effort uh, supporting those uh, units. Uh, many of you know Tricia McCain Ebright. Uh, she is on my team now as the grants and awards manager. She's been around for a number of years managing the faculty grants and awards program and limited submissions across campus. And uh, Mindy Lowe uh, has been in our office, I think for about two years. Um, and she supports Tricia on the limited submissions uh, and uh, faculty grants and awards. So what do we do in research development? Um, you, some of you have heard me talk about research development before in which I refer to it as pre-award -pre services. So those things include things like workshops and programs, services and tools, uh, any kinds of resources that will help our faculty be more, and researchers broadly, uh, be more strategic and competitive in going after funding. So these include things like helping them be better grant writers, uh, helping them think about what to apply for when, connecting them to funding opportunities, um, uh, helping them connect with program officers, you know, that sort of thing, so that they're, they're thinking about uh, how to, to best position themselves and prepare for uh, pursuing this, this research funding. Uh, we also do work around institutional and or unit strategy for catalyzing interdisciplinary research and growing research capacity. Um, what does that look like in practice? Well, to talk a little bit about the, the categories um, of the services and support we offer, we have, uh, uh, this is what Tricia runs for us, the faculty grants and limited submissions, a part of our work. These are longstanding services and programs in the Office of Research. Um, Tricia runs a weekly limited submission announcement. I have some news about that that is gonna be changing a little bit and I'll touch on that in a second. So many of you are subscribed to those weekly announcements. We manage about 300 or we promote about 300 limited submission funding opportunities every year. And on average, I think around 30 of those go to internal competition. Uh, those do not include the ones that are run out of the Medical School Office of Research. Uh, and then we process about a million dollars in internal grant funding through the Faculty Grants and Awards Program. Uh, some of you know that's been on pause since last October and we're in the process of um, overhauling the program, uh, revising it and relaunching it, and we hope sometime early in 2021 for that. We provide workshops and webinars. Uh, we had over 700 faculty, staff, and students attend our workshops and webinars in uh, fiscal year 20. We started a Grantsmanship 101 webinar series, which we launched in June, and uh, those were all recorded, and, and I have links all on one slide at the end, so you all can connect with those resources. Um, we put on events or workshops that are hosted both by our, our office, so we, we plan them and coordinate them and do registration for them, but we can also do them by request. Uh, we do them for groups like Advance and, um, you know, other units around campus. Uh, topics can include grant writing, any aspect of grant writing, science communication, team science, uh, any range of things, and we tailor these for the audience. You can let us know what your faculty might be looking for, and we can tailor something for their needs. Uh, we also are getting into doing team facilitations. Uh, this means we're helping teams who uh, are starting to come together, work together, learn how to work together better, how to surface innovative ideas. So we're doing ideation and brainstorming sessions, helping them do proposal planning where we can you know, um, uh, help them outline a proposal and uh, get action items going. Um, in my experience working with PIs, many of them just uh, write these proposals alone in their office with the door closed. Uh, and uh, some of these facilitations we do really enable them to, um, you know, come together and bounce ideas off of each other. And it's really invigorating experience for them. So I recommend uh, if they take advantage of this and Mishar is doing uh, activities like this as well. Uh, we can do strategic planning for teams or units, and uh, we can help them build networks. Uh, we, we worked with the Center for Human Growth and Development last year uh, to build a, a, a network of faculty who uh, had a, um, uh, a topic in, uh, in common and really wondered how they could start uh, working better together and, uh, and doing some discovery around what, uh, what their interests were. So we do proposal development and editing, uh, funding consultations. We can do large scale support, uh, such as project management or drafting various documents and editing, uh, red team reviews, pink team reviews, which are preliminary <laughs> reviews, 
uh, compared to red team reviews. Editing services will edit any kinds of grant proposals and can get those turned around in three to five business days, usually depending on our capacity at the time. And building resources, uh, we put together a proposal library that has a, a real diversity of proposal samples in it, uh, NIH, NSF, a number of foundations in there as well, a number of other federal agencies, uh, a toolkit for putting together NIH S10 proposals, um, because it's, it became clear when we did some benchmarking that we could be doing much better in that space compared to our peers. We have a list of freelance editors in case uh, our researchers need to go out and um, you know they want to pay someone to do it in case we can't provide exactly uh, what uh, what it is they're looking for or need something more than what we can do with our capacity and uh, we'll soon have a small library of facilities and resources templates um, that we think will be valuable especially for uh, interdisciplinary proposals that span the campuses so as I mentioned, uh, there are some changes coming. Those limited submission funding opportunity announcements, they get sent out every Friday afternoon in order to reduce email burden, which I know everyone feels. Uh, we are going to start, we are moving the limited submission announcements to the Blueprint newsletter that comes out of our office. So the Research Blueprint, and many of you subscribe to both of them, the Blueprint now is going to come out twice a month. and. Uh, um, what you're losing instead are four of those limited submission emails that come out each month. So you're going from uh, uh, five emails a month to two emails a month because we're going to put out the blueprint twice uh, to make sure that these announcements are still timely. So uh, we will make sure if you are subscribed to the limited submissions announcements, we will make sure that you are subscribed to the blueprint mailing list. Uh, so you don't need to do anything about that. Just know that um, uh, you need to look for the blueprint if you are scanning limited submissions announcements uh, and, and we'll highlight a few of them and then hopefully just um, uh, uh, push up mo most of our readers to the limited submissions page so you can see the full list of what's available. Um, and as I mentioned, we're developing and launching the new faculty grants and awards program. Uh, it is going to look a little bit different than it has in the past and there are more details coming. Our AVP Tabby Chavis is, is running that. What else are we working on? Uh, some exciting things. We're, we're wanting to increase support for faculty in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Uh, we are developing protocols for institutional honors and prizes. These are things that are not grant uh, funding, grant awards, but things that leadership often need to nominate uh, our faculty for. Um, we are better preparing faculty, or we want to help prepare faculty to pursue large-scale funding proposals, so some training around that. Um, we want to enhance institutional strategy for obtaining large scale, uh, large center and institute grants. And that includes things like uh, doing pink team reviews. So giving teams feedback well in advance of when we would even run an internal competition for some of these limited uh, center opportunities. Uh, improving communication and collaboration across units. Uh, we're working on DEI in research, uh, broadening participation and diversity in the review process for internal competitions and funding opportunities. And uh, I am working with some of your research administration experts who uh, I love to collaborate with whenever I can. Uh, Kathy S.O., uh, Stephanie Hensel, Becky O'Brien, Melissa Carby, Nick Pryor. Uh, they are amazing and uh, I am uh, helping them. <laughs> I bow to their uh, superior knowledge on budgets. And uh, we're developing a workshop that we hope to roll out in early 2021 that is a faculty-centered budget workshop. So what PIs need to know about budgets that's still in development that could change, title would likely change, um, but you can look forward to that. Uh, uh, there was a request for these kinds of um, workshops from our researchers. So uh, exciting things. Um, these are all the links. I, I believe you all have uh, access to the slides, so you can hit live links there uh, to our web page, to the Blueprint sign up, uh, the proposal library, the recordings of the webinar series. And uh, we have an event coming up uh, on November 20th, which is around broader impacts for those of you that work specifically with uh, NSF proposals or um, you know, funding uh, foundation opportunities that require you know, public engagement, community engagement, and broad impact type uh, statements. Um, all of the resources, we're gonna have uh, representatives from all the units on campus who work in this space. 
So um, I will wrap it up. Uh, any of you can reach out to me anytime. Let me stop the share here and uh, hand it back off to our, our hosts. You know what, Jill, we have one question that came through the Q&A. The yeah. question is, I'm not familiar with red slash pink reviews. Could you please clarify what this is? Yes, um, so red team reviews are what are done uh, often in the School of Engineering. And this is when um, uh, draft proposals are submitted to a team. So it's like going through uh, the merit re review process or study section before it gets submitted to sponsor. So it's an internal review panel where uh, teams are getting uh, really robust feedback to help shape and strengthen their proposals before they get to um, to the sponsor review panel. Uh, pink team reviews would be even more in advance of red team reviews. So we're talking about doing uh, pink team reviews for the Energy Frontier Research Centers um, uh, very quickly. So the, we expect the RFP to come out for those next November. So November 2021, we're backing up further. So we expect that the internal competition would be over the summer of 2021. And we're talking about in February of 2021, doing a pink team review uh, with any interested teams to submit draft proposals. So we can help them uh, turn in a quality proposal even for the internal process. So um, really uh, you know, giving them as much feedback as possible to, um, to make sure we're submitting as high quality proposals as we can to sponsors. All right, thanks, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so um, Chris, if you could flip it to the next slide, we are back to the 100th anniversary stuff. And I wanted to give you guys, we're gonna jump forward to the early 1970s, give you a little history about ORSP during that time frame. Um, in the early 1970s, there was not actually a formalized dress code, but informally, everyone knew that women were required to wear skirts and men were expected to wear a suit, a tie, and a white shirt. As you might predict in the 1970s, women started to kind of assert themselves in the workplace. And there was a, a woman in the office, Hazel Young, who was described as a tell it like it is type of person. And she decided she was going to start a petition to allow women to wear pantsuits if they chose. Um, of course, the assistant director in the office got wind of this idea um, and he decided to head this off at the pass and go ahead and approach the director, Mr. Robert Burroughs at the time and request this allowance for the women in the office. Um, after speaking with Mr. Burroughs, he went ahead and approached Hazel and told her to please not spearhead anything, um, that they would go ahead and let them start wearing pants as long as they dressed professionally. So the women in the office um, won their small victory and began wearing their pants and pants suits to work. After this, the men in the office felt a little empowered and decided to start wearing colored shirts. Very exciting. It is interesting to read some of this history from back then, because in today's times, um, it just seems so, I don't know, cute and a little antiquated, but really fun to see that we took the time to record this. Some other things um, from our history that were, that someone in the office actually took the time to write down and record for us. Back in the 70s, again, Early data analysis was accomplished through some state-of-the-art calculators uh, called Friden calculators at the time. And they looked a lot like typewriters. They were um, large contraptions. You can see them in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of this slide. And they sounded a lot like those printers from the 1990s, you know, that made that kind of screeching, tapping noise. Um, Dennis said that it made a wonderful sound, letting Mr. Burroughs, the director, know that he was hard at work in the next office. Um, eventually, technology advanced even further, and one of the project representatives in the office suggested they purchase a groundbreaking new personal computer. The director loved the idea until he heard the name of the computer. It was a Macintosh um, by Apple. 
He thought a product with such a silly name would not be around long and did not want to purchase it. So for a while after that, data entry was accomplished using computers located in the anatomy lab. The person assigned to data entry had the pleasure of the company of cadavers while they were entering data for the office. Eventually the office did go ahead and invest in two of those Mac computers. I'm sure much to the relief of that poor staff member. Um, the university also has a really long history of outreach in its research portfolio with international partners. Communication back and forth between the researcher and campus was vital. The internet obviously did not exist at that time. And there was an office within the Office of Research Administration that facilitated communication using a device known as a teletype. The teletype messages were similar to telegrams but used key punch codes to transmit messages. Interesting about all of these different uh, technologies that were used back then. As you can see too, um, obviously after they won the right to wear pants, that, that picture down in the middle of the um, bottom row on the slide, she is surrounded by paper, presumably proposals that were being submitted. Um, and we were talking with Craig, our best guess is that the device behind her might have been some sort of binding machine. So interesting history. Linda, I'll pass it off to you to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Chris, could you advance the slide, please? And so it is with pleasure that I introduce Colleen Green. Uh, Colleen is a graduate of the University of Michigan. Colleen joined M Healthy, the University of Michigan's wellness and risk reduction program, as a wellness coordinator in 1996. She has been quoted in several national and local publications on employee wellness, as well as being interviewed on Good Morning America. Her current responsibilities as senior wellness coordinator include teaching exercise classes like Zumba, body sculpting, Pilates, and others. She also um, includes teaching on personal training, running incentive programs such as ActiveU, and presenting seminars on fitness, stress management and general wellness. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So I'm gonna go ahead, I think, and share my screen. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna share there. Okay, let me get the slideshow to start. And can everyone see that first slide, um, wellness at the University of Michigan? Yes. Excellent, thank you. So let's go ahead and start with well being. So, how would one define well being? Well, it's kind of a difficult question, right? Because it, it means something to someone, and it might mean something completely different to someone else. So, what we do at M Healthy is we use the philosophy of well being. And many of you have probably seen this. Um, it's our eight pedal philosophy of well-being, and I'll just briefly go through it. The reason we do this is because we want to make sure that folks, um, like I said, there's so many different areas in which people can work on their well-being. And we want to make sure that we're honoring everyone, no matter in which area they're working. So, for example, physical. And people think physical is just physical activity. Well, it's more than just that. It's practicing the healthy behaviors around physical activity, nutrition, sleep substance abuse, and so on, okay? There's emotional and mental, thriving while fully experiencing the diverse range of human emotions, and that's that thriving, that's a verb we haven't heard a lot in the last several months, um, but that's something we want to help folks get to that point. Um, environmental, living in, working in, and contributing to safe, healthy, and sustainable environments, and as we've, many of us have moved to our homes, um, or we're doing a blended uh, work site, this is becoming even more important than ever. Financial, developing knowledge and skills for making financial decisions. Uh, occupational, we've got social, intellectual, spiritual. These are all different areas um, in which people can be working on their wellness. And if you're interested in getting this exact um, slide, it actually is on the M Healthy webpage. What about self-care though? How would you define self-care? And that's another 
um, difficult thing because I was actually doing a presentation similar to this a couple of weeks ago. And I said, you know, how would you define self-care? And someone actually thought it was being a little bit selfish to uh, take some time for self-care. Of course it's not. And of course, especially at this time, it's ever more important. Self-care is the act of caring for oneself to maintain wellness and or to prevent future illness or injury. So it's so very important that what we do today, we recognize effects tomorrow and so on and so on. I, I say to folks, think of your top five priorities in life and you need to make sure you're in those top five priorities. First of all, because you're worth it. You are worth being in your top five priorities. But also if you are not taking time for self-care, if you're not putting yourself in your top five priorities, how are you gonna be able to handle your other priorities? How are you gonna be able to do your job, your household, your family, whatever it might be? You're not going to be able to. So self-care is a very important part of what we're working on now. So one of the things we're gonna do is desk stretches. So for the moment, I'm just gonna go ahead and stop sharing just so hopefully you all can see me. I'd like, I don't know if there's an opportunity to pinpoint or spotlight me. And then what we'd like to do is I'd like everyone that feels comfortable doing so to go ahead and stand up. And I am going to show you a few stretches that you can do at your desk. Um, one of the things we try to get folks to do is move throughout the day. And it was certainly easier when everyone was in the same office, you know, one could actually run up and down the, the hallway, hey, get up and move. Um, but right now I know it's difficult. And especially because if you are in your home, you're there all the time. Oh, that computer's there. I could sit down and do some more work. So we're going to show you some stretches to do. We'd like you to at best move at least once an hour. Uh, but at least once every couple of hours. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, we're going to hinge at the hips. We're going to bend over at the waist. Come on down just to your point of discomfort and just hold. Continue to breathe. You're going to feel this in your lower back and also your hamstrings, which are the back of your legs. And just roll back on out. That felt good, didn't it? All right. We're going to go ahead and lace our hands together, push out, back out in a C, so kind of like this, and up, shoulder blades down. And these are areas that you either overuse, as we're using right now, or with the legs underuse. All right, let's put our hands out to the side now, thumbs up, pull back. This is going to stretch your pecs, okay? When we're typing at our computer all day, this tends to tighten up. We think it's back here. We keep pressing here and trying to stretch that. This is what's tightening up. So pull back and hold. And relax. Let's do a few more stretches. Bring one arm across and look that way. So if your right arm is across, you're going to look to your right. If your left arm is across, you're going to look to your left. Now, what we'd like to do is hold these for 15 to 60 seconds. We don't always have the time to do that, so everything helps. And that's what some folks say, oh, I don't have enough time to get a good workout in. Hey, any exercise is good exercise, all right? So perfect time right now, you're in a Zoom webinar, your cameras are turned off, there are some things to do. I'm gonna show you one more stretch because there are some times where you feel like you may not be able to get up. So I'm going to have you take your right hand, well, it'll look like your left. So take your left hand, palm down on your chair and sit on it, okay? Now take the opposite hand and push the ear towards the opposite shoulder. Very gently, you're gonna feel a nice stretch along the side of your neck there. And it's another area that tightens up, oh, so much when we sit at a computer all day. You always wanna breathe through your stretches. Okay, let's go ahead and the other side. Sit on that hand, palm down, and we're gently going the other way. I don't know about you, but it feels really good to me. I had a very busy day and I haven't taken the time to stretch every hour as I should have. And back up. Now we have these and many other stretches on our web page. 
and I'll get to that a little bit later, but um, they are, it's in the time to move section. So you would go to mhealthy.umich.edu and you would put in time to move um, in the search engine and you would come up with these and many more stretches, okay? All right, let's go ahead and go on to the next page. Now, one of the other things that we talked about a little bit is mental and emotional health. And certainly right now, um, there is, there's a lot of stressors we never had before. Uh, one of the biggest ones is our lack of control, right? And that is so, so difficult to not be able to control so many things that we used to have control over. So what we're gonna do now is one of my favorite ways to manage my wellness in terms of mental and emotional health, and it's called visualization. So what I'd like folks to do is go ahead and sit with their feet flat on the ground. Just relax into your chair, let your back gently touch the chair back. And I'd like you to go ahead and close your eyes. I have a little background music for us. What I'd like you to do is just focus on your breathing. You don't have to change your breathing right now. Just focus. Are you breathing shallowly or are you breathing deeply? Are you breathing rapidly or slowly? Now go ahead and picture yourself in your favorite location place where you feel at your very best. Some people picture the forest or the river or a beach. Wherever you feel at your best, go ahead and picture yourself in that location. Now we're going to look at the sensory attributes to make this even more vivid in your mind. With your eyes still closed, what do you see in that favorite location of yours? Are there objects, different colors, people, buildings? What do you see in your favorite location? Now, what do you hear in your favorite location? Are there nature sounds? Are there sounds of other people? What do you hear? What do you smell in your favorite location? Is it food? Is it flowers? What do you smell in that favorite location of yours? Stay in this favorite location for a moment, continuing to tour its various sensory aspects. And as you do, feel yourself becoming more calm and serene. Feel your muscles relaxing and your breathing continue to deepen and slow. Assure yourself that you can come back to this location anytime you want or need to relax. Now take your time, but when you feel ready, go ahead and open your eyes. So hopefully you took a little bit of time for you and hopefully you feel a little bit better. That's just something that you can do when you can't take a lot of time 
but you want to manage your stress a little bit. You could do this a few times a day. You could do it. Um, I actually was speaking with a woman the other day. She did it in the kitchen while the rest of her family was preparing dinner. So it actually can be done uh, with others in the room or even better though, um, in a place by yourself if you can. So some of the M Healthy offerings, um, again, this is from our webpage. We are mostly for um, faculty and staff. We do offer services for others, especially um, spouses and others, students and so on. So these are some of them you can see, physical activity, nutrition, weight management, and so on. And all of this is on our webpage. But just a few I wanted to point out, um, we do have a resource coach, an unhealthy resource coach. Um, and she will help folks, especially with financial wellness. Um, in this time, right now, we know a lot of people are having, having some concerns with that based on a variety of different things. Um, in 2020. Um, so feel free to contact her. She has many resources um, to which she can offer. We offer healthy recipes. We have over 500 healthy recipes um, in our website and you can look for them by uh, what meal of the day. So put entree for lunch or something like that. Or you can also say, well, look, I have a lot of chicken in my refrigerator. What can I do with it? And you can search for recipes by chicken. Okay. Uh, we have alcohol management and tobacco consultation, and a lot of people don't know we offer those services. And as all of ours are, they're all confidential, um, and they do, of course, now virtual sessions with folks. Mental and emotional wellness, as I mentioned, um, and what we did a little bit before with the visualization, we have whole seminars on that. Uh, we have things on our YouTube channel and a lot of other things for mental and emotional wellness. And we have a free virtual exercise and relaxation classes. So I'm not sure how many of you go on to Workplace. It is like a Facebook thing for work, right? And all you'd need to do is you'd need to go onto the page um, and it's the overall U of M page. And you'll see things like this. This is our schedule. And this was actually the schedule for, I think, a week ago. Um, and these are the different classes we have. So all of the classes are free. All you'd need to do is go into Workplace at whichever time it is if you'd like to see the class live. But we do video all of our classes. So say, for example, I taught a class this morning at 8 a.m. Say you wanted to take that class, but you weren't available at 8 a.m., you just go on to Workplace whenever you are available and you can go ahead and do that class. All right. So we just wanna remind folks that we are all in this together. So please remember that when you're having difficulty getting through things, please reach out to someone um, if you need help and please reach out to others when you feel they might need help as well. So again, the M Healthy contact information is mhealthy.umich.edu is our webpage and then mhealthy at umich.edu is where you could contact us with emails. Okay. So unless there were any questions in the chat box for us, um, I don't think there is. So if there are any quick questions, you know, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, please do remember that M Healthy is here for you, and we're here to help you with whichever area of wellness on which you're working. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. I, I really enjoyed going to the beach for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I am going to go through this last little segment on our history quickly so that we can try and get back on track on time. Um, just a little bit of current or recent history. So in 1985, we had our very first female VPR, Linda Wilson. Um, and after her tenure, um, we've had a lot of technology advancements and changes in how we do our job. She actually approved funding for our very first electronic research administration system called PRISM. And as, since then, we have moved over to ERPM which we still use today. 
having ERPM has enabled us to um, adapt to today's reality of operating during COVID and working from home. I think if we didn't have a system like that, we would not have been in a position to do such a smooth transition in this new world that we are living in. Um, we also went paperless um, at some point during that 35 year um, period since Linda was in charge. And we now have our second female VPR, Rebecca Cunningham, who was appointed this year to the position um, formally and no longer an in interim. So that is really wonderful to see um, that kind of position advancing and seeing women in research reaching those high levels. It's really inspiring. We also are the top funded public research institution in the country today and the top recipient of NSF funding, which is a really high achievement. Um, and of course, our, our uh, feather in our cap for 2020 and for Craig, after 100 years, we finally have a deadline policy. So with that, I will turn it over to Craig. Hello, everyone. Chris, you're driving, right? I am. So, okay, I will, I will do my best to get up to speed. Uh, Andrea, if I, I have some bad news for you, though. If your job is to keep me from losing my hair, the prospects of your next employee evaluation don't look so good. Um, but breaking news from the ORSP Command Center, formerly known as my basement, um, we'll, we've got a couple of updates. Um, next slide, starting with our new staff. Let me uh, welcome Ivana Tullett and Sabrina Wilson, who both joined the RSP team. Uh, Ivana is formerly in health system compliance, corporate compliance, uh, and works in the data use agreement area. And Sabrina is one of our new administrative assistants uh, that uh, reports to Tracy Schwab. So we're delighted to have them on board. Um, also, kudos to our own David Mulder, who I have the privilege of working with on a daily basis in his new role of international engagement, security, and compliance. Um, but he's being recognized for his exceptional service to UMOR as well. I would also just like to uh, acknowledge how happy I am that Linda and Andrea, your, your MCs for today, are on the ORSP team as well, and they are making my life so much easier. It's, it, they are fantastic additions. So congratulations, David. Uh, I, I did want to um, go over some best practices for communicating with ORSP uh, because um, I, I think that there has been some con concern uh, in the research administration community that since we all went, moon, went remote, um, that we are somehow inaccessible. And so, um, it would be not a bad idea to just briefly go over some of the best practices that obtain both while we're in the office as well as while we're working remotely. So uh, um, one of the suggestions I have is to simply make sure that you're checking with all the local resources you have before you reach out to RSP. Um, if the answer is at the unit, unit level or at the dean level, then, then that's one less call that needs to break through the, the signal to noise ratio in RSP of, of multiple uh, uh, communications. So check locally. Um, we do prefer that the project teams use the request RSP action when it's available in the system. And that's important to know because um, it enables not only the staff that are assigned to that award record or path uh, and puts that uh, record in their work queue, but it also is visible to anyone who might be providing coverage. So uh, a posted comment doesn't do that. It's very helpful uh, if there are time sensitive issues uh, that you describe what might be the consequence of being untimely so that we're, we're able to prioritize the, the many requests that we receive all at one time. Um, you should know that ORSP phones are not being forwarded to private numbers. 
Um, that's per ITS's request that um, offices don't set that up. Uh, but we have arranged for all of our OSP phone numbers to immediately go to voicemail. And those voicemails are then computer uh, transcribed, sometimes amusingly, and forwarded via email. So if you leave a voicemail for OSP, uh, it will get uh, forwarded via email to the recipient and they will be able to respond accordingly. Whenever you are communicating with OSP, uh, this is not news, but it's a good practice to include some sort of reference number that helps us to look up the record so we don't have to go searching and uh, include a su su succinct description of the request. Um, it's al also not helpful if, you, if multiple communications on the same topic uh, are received or multiple communications to different people within OSP are received. Um, the, the classic case being uh, getting, a, getting email saying, I just left you a, a, a voicemail um, and now I have two, two uh, communications that I need to keep track of. And uh, we also actively discourage the use of Google chat. Um, it's, it's kind of like bursting into someone's office and demanding to be standing in the front of the line. So we would en encourage uh, that folks don't use Google chat. But the main message is I want you to know that we are uh, listening, we're responsive, we're getting the messages. And uh, if, if you haven't heard from us, um, it's because we're prioritizing other requests at the same time. So Chris, next slide. Uh, also, uh, something that you should be aware of is a, a, a new pilot that David Mulder is, is leading up for review of international activities. And this, this relates to the review of other support documentation for federal sponsors and the new questions on international engagement that were added to the PI sign or the sign PAP activity. So whenever a PI or uh, uh, an investigator answers yes to one of the international engagement questions on the sign PAF activity, it sets a flag for David to go uh, look at the other support documentation that is going to be submitted or, or um, will be submitted, but at least prior to award. And that's a new compliance state if that review process hasn't been completed. Next slide. So, um, on the agency up front, uh, there's never a shortage of in news and interesting things to, to keep track of. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. Two that I'll mention, um, one is a new requirement, next slide, Chris, on uh, federally prohibited equipment and services. This is a new term and condition that applies to federal grants and contracts. And it basically it prohibits purchasing or using services or equipment from the companies that you see on that list or any of their subsidiaries or affiliates. The take home message here is don't use your P card for purchasing anything from Huawei, ZTE, Hytera, and, and the other companies on that list. We have worked through procurement to ensure that, uh, the, that our systems that, that procurement uses uh, don't allow for these kind of transactions to occur, but the P-card is a particular area of compliance uh, that we need to be mindful of everyone. Uh, so I, I did that pretty quickly. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say, I can only imagine, you know, in a hundred years time, when uh, ORSP's 200th anniversary, they'll be talking about how we were all tethered to our bodies and how, uh, how unimaginable that must have been. So um, I'm looking forward to that 200 year anniversary. I plan to be around. Uh, so next up, let me uh, introduce Debbie Talley, the queen of research administration, my colleague and friend. I'm, I'm welcome her to, to the party, Debbie. Thanks, Craig. It's good to, oh, oh. are we good? Um, there was one question that came up about, um, what the university is doing around the, the recent executive order about diversity and federal contractors. And I, I can tell you that the Office of General Counsel is looking at that executive order particularly to see what can be done, if anything, or if the university um, is, plans to do anything. So that's under active consideration. And I would also hope that you would uh, 
uh, look for the president's statement uh, regarding the executive order that was on, out on the web. And uh, I can provide a URL to that later. So now I'm done. All right, great. Thanks, Craig. Um, and good to talk to all of you again today. Um, next slide, please. So I just have a few updates. Um, the first is one of our favorite topics, um, audits. Um, so at this point, we are um, working on the single audit or the auditors are. Um, we have a meeting next week with them, but we are not going to be um, closing on the audit anytime soon because of the funds that the university received under the CARES Act. Um, so at this point, um, I would expect that it'll be a little while before we have any updates to share with this group about the single audit, um, but just some information that it is truly ongoing. The other thing I wanted to share with everyone is a new audit that the university um, just um, met with NSF about last Friday. Um, the NSF has made a decision to um, perform an audit um, that covers the period of March 1st through September 30th of this year. And they're really looking at how the university implemented the guidance that was provided through OMB. So um, they have several questions that they're asking us, and then they're going to be looking at some transactions. So we'll probably have more information to share with you um, throughout the um, rest of this year and into the um, beginning of next year. Um, they have explained to us that um, this is not going to be anything like our data analytics audit, which was very in-depth and time consuming, but more to come. So um, the next slide is um, just to share with you our favorite topic, I guess, next to audits is really our financial status reports. And at this time of the year, um, we consider this our busy season. Uh, this year, between, that, uh, between September and um, December, before we go on break, um, we have a total of 2,128 reports that are due. And as of right now, um, this actually is a little outdated. Um, it's last year's slide. But as of right now, we have completed 950 reports, or about 45%. So thank you to all of you who um, work with our reporting accountants to get those reports reviewed with your PIs and return to us. Um, there's many reports that are due um, at the end of every month. So this week happens to be quite busy for our reporting accountants and our administrative staff who are submitting all of those reports online. So um, thank you. And um, we do really appreciate the fact that you're getting those back to us right away. Next slide, please. The next thing I wanted to share, and actually um, this is something that if Chris was speaking, he would be sharing, but um, coming soon, there will be changes to contract administration's invoice process. Um, so currently the concurrence receipt, which is required for all invoices on sub awards, subcontracts, um, is going to change from what we refer to as kind of a manual process to online workflow and approval through M Pathways. This does require Duo, and it's one of the reasons that when this was a topic from the process subcommittee, um, we waited until the faculty and everyone on campus actually was required to use Duo before we even started the discussion about implementing. So it does require duo. Um, the PIs and PDs will no longer have to print out the concurrence receipt and sign it. They will actually approve it through um, uh, the workflow that will come right to them in M Pathways. And we're fortunate to have Chris DeVry who is going to uh, be um, holding a Navigate webinar tomorrow. Um, I'm sorry, on Thursday, Thursday, October 29th at 11 a.m. And you do still have time to register if you're interested, and you need to do that by noon tomorrow. And I think that is the end of my slides. If there are any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, um, I am going to turn it over to Carolyn for the update from ITS.
Uh, good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Thomas with eResearch Proposal Management, and I'm going to walk you through a few slides as a preview to our next eResearch Proposal Management release. So, Chris, if you want to go ahead, thank you. We are upgrading uh, our framework to a version 9.0. And for you, that means we're going to be doing some user interface changes and hopefully some navigation improvements. Um, this is a widespread change, so it impacts all the projects you currently use in ERPM, PATH, AWARD, SF424, subcase, UFAs, um, agreement acceptance requests. I'm sure I've forgotten one, but everything. We have it scheduled right now for the weekend of November 20th and 21st. That means that we will, um, similar to our other upgrades, we usually shut the, the system down starting Friday night, and then we're back up again um, prior to Monday morning, 6 a.m. And if we finish early, we would um, bring the system up um, before that. If things, our testing doesn't go as planned and we need a little more time, we do have a backup weekend, which is December 5th and 6th. But right now it looks like we are tracking for the 20th and 21st. For those of you who work in regulatory management in MN form, that um, system upgrade has already happened. So some of the things I'm gonna show you look very sim similar to those other two systems. And then also to let you know, those of you who work in animal management or ERAM, that upgrade will follow ours in early 2021. So let's go through some of the changes. These are just highlights of, of kind of a sneak preview. And when we do the actual release, we will have more detailed release notes. So we're gonna talk about um, what we call the forms menu. Those of you who are familiar with e-research, we have always used something at the top of the page called the jump to. And when you um, click on that, it shows you all the forms, like here are all the forms in the path. That is actually moving to the side of the page. So you'll see on the screenshot on the right, the what formerly was a jump to just appears when you open the actual first page of the path. And as you're filling it out, if you decide you need more real estate, you can click on the little arrow and you can see it there in the red box and remove that and then you get the full screen. I'm ready to move on, great, thank you. The other thing that has changed, again, moving from something that was on the top or the bottom is the height show errors. Um, on this particular screenshot, I have an example of a SF424 project, which has the high show errors at the bottom. The new look, when you do a validate on any of the project types, you're going to see the list of errors falling to the left-hand side of the page. And similar to the old format, you just click on the blue highlight where the red is, and that will take you to the actual error. So the functionality is the same, just look is a little bit different more modernized. And then the third thing is the pop-ups that used to happen. So when you um, went to the administrative home of a path to select a different organization or um, you selected a, I'm trying to think of another, we have a lot of pop-ups. Those have all changed to um, a new format, which is called a slide-in. And when you click on the admin home in this case, instead of popping up the actual list of organizations slides in from the right-hand side of the screen. The other thing that has changed, and I think it's um, actually a great change, especially for those of you who um, are filling out long pages and always have to scroll to the top or the bottom of the page to do a save or an exit, the new way to do it is on the right-hand side of the screen and the exit and the save and the continue are floating. So you don't have to scroll all the way to the bottom of the page or all the way to the top of the page to access one of those controls. And then the last one I wanna show you today is when you save and exit or decide not to save and exit a project and you go back in, the system remembers where you were the last time in the application. And you get a little welcome back sign. And if you wanna continue there, you can um, continue typing on that page or you can select another page. 
And I, that is the last of my slides for today. So look for detailed notes um, from us closer to the weekend of November 20th. And I'm now passing it back to Chris DeVries for some training updates. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm actually not joining you from the Michigan League, although I wish I were. So we've done a lot of rehearsing for this. So um, the one thing we weren't able to do is rehearse in the league. But quick update um, from the Navigate team. Um, I'm here as a stand-in for the Navigate team, but um, some things that we wanted to go through. Um, all of the fundamentals course, uh, the fundamentals course is on hold for right now, as well as the advanced budgeting courses. Uh, we're currently looking at ways that we can move those to um, virtual learning, but as you can hopefully appreciate, given the content in those courses, um, that's a quite a, a large undertaking. However, we are working on some of the courses in terms of moving them to a virtual learning, um, and that is the Budgeting Basics course. Um, we will have a, a pilot course for that in November or December. More information will be forthcoming. Uh, we are limiting that um, course to 15 folks. Uh, and again, that's kind of to help us uh, learn the ropes in terms of the virtual learning. We've also scheduled a pilot course for the Uniform Guidance Cost Principles course, um, and that will be held in February 2021. So more information to come on that. Additionally, you may have seen the Navigate team putting out quite a few webinars on various topics that are of interest to research administrators. Those past sessions may all be found on the Navigate website. There are recordings, and then if there are any supplementary materials for those particular sessions, those can also be found on the Navigate site as well. Uh, as Debbie Talley mentioned, I will be providing a webinar that goes through the subrecipient invoice approval process that will soon be moving to M Pathways. That webinar is this week, Thursday at 11 o'clock. We would ask that you register by tomorrow at noon, and we will have all of that information, the recording and any materials available afterwards. I can also say that I have given quite a few updates at the various RAC meetings over the last few weeks, and I will be actually, I'm happy to give presentations or, or provide assistance to any units or groups that need it. So please reach out to me if you have questions or if you'd like to have me come out and do a special session just for your group. Another reminder is our Essentials e-learning modules. Those are all available. And if you recall, we expanded that suite quite substantially over the last year. So I won't read through all of those topics that are available. Suffice to say, hopefully those are topics that you can find valuable. And especially if you have a couple free minutes in your day, uh, those can certainly help with your professional development. Is there any other volume control on that? Well, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, we do have some other professional development resources on the Navigate website, and those may be found at the link here. And again, we'll circulate all of the materials from this meeting after the fact. Another uh, update that we wanted to provide is about the, the Research Administration Mentoring Program, or RAMP. We've decided to put the program on pause for now, mostly because of the feedback that we received from the sixth cohort. Uh, specifically related to the pandemic. We initially thought we could just simply go through the materials and, and revise them, anything that speaks to meeting in person, changing that to a virtual, but we really found that the participants in the last cohort, the pandemic really kind of shifted how and if they were able to attend. And that's not for everyone, but a lot of the feedback that we received indicated that we should take another look at this. So that's what we're planning to do. So we're effectively on pause at this point. I will be working with the Navigate team to transfer a lot of the knowledge that I have from the program and a lot of the historical information that's out there. Um, so please look for more information coming soon. And we hope that we can address all of the needs of our mentors and mentees um, by moving this to a virtual format. If you have questions or comments or, or need clarification on any of this, please reach out to the Navigate team at navigate-research at umich.edu. 
And so I wanted to also give a professional development update. We'll have some updates from our professional societies as we typically do, although I have to say they're, they're, they're fairly sparse in terms of what you might have seen uh, previously. Uh, in Cura, the Region 4 spring meeting is being planned right now uh, for April 25th through 28th in 2021 in Minneapolis. It's my understanding though that I think uh, the, the region is gonna do a little bit of investigating in terms of um, the feasibility, especially given a lot of the travel restrictions that universities have. Um, so I think the best bet is to, to go to the uh, Region 4 website for more information. Additionally, Encura is putting on their FRA, Financial Research Administration, and PRA, Pre-Awarded Research Administration courses. Uh, I do see that they do have locations for those. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's in sunny California. But again, uh, due to maybe travel restrictions, um, as well as who knows what's going to be happening with the pandemic, uh, it's probably best to pay attention to Encura.edu for more information. Uh, the National Organization of Research Development Professionals, or NORDUP, um, you heard uh, our introduction from Jill Jividen. She is, she is heavily involved in NORDUP. Um, the Great Lakes Regional Meeting, which was uh, originally supposed to be in November 2020, has been rescheduled to late winter. Um, there's not a firm date on that yet, but uh, more information will be forthcoming. Additionally, they are planning the national meeting for May of 2021, and a call for abstracts will be issued soon. Uh, Jill informs me that it's uh, her best advice is to go to nordipnews.org um, for all of the latest information there. Uh, SRAI, the Society of Research Administrators International, the Midwest section is planning a joint section meeting with the Western section in May of 2021 in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, again, I would anticipate this is probably uh, pending any, any travel restrictions or um, the current status of the pandemic. Excuse me. There's more information here if you would like to uh, contact the, the Michigan chapter group. Um, their email address and website are here. I'm also pleased to announce on behalf of the RAC Communications Subcommittee that our Research Administration Forum is now live on Workplace. Uh, you heard Colleen Green mention Workplace, and if you've been there for some of those exercise classes or other activities that M Healthy is putting on, uh, you may have seen the U of M Research Administration Forum. It's open to anyone who would like to uh, join the group or just simply peruse what we have out there. Um, and one thing that we wanted to remind folks is, although Workplace is a Facebook product, um, you don't need a Facebook account to join the group or to access Workplace. And Workplace also does not link your Facebook account to your Workplace account. Uh, we really envision this being a place where folks can share tips and tricks in terms of research administration, um, any announcements that they might have or job postings. We did get a very good response when we had a, a strong cohort of research administrators test out the forum and actually populate it with content. So our hope is that it's of, of use and of value to you. I did want to mention that uh, our UMore staff awards are following the RAND meeting. So um, we will have a, a brief pause in between, but we encourage you to stick around. And as you may know from previous years, we have um, compiled some fun facts about our awardees. So I'll go through those right now. Our uh, friend, David Mulder, David informs us that he has a twin brother, which I'm sure some of you probably knew that. David also won the Cub Scout Pinewood Derby in third grade. As a former participant in a Pinewood Derby, I'm very jealous. I could never get my car to even go down the ramp, so I'm very jealous. Um, David had to be saved from falling into a dike in Amsterdam, and he didn't provide more details, but I'm sure it's a, it's a very good story. And he also performed with the actor who played Poseidon in, in Clash of the Titans. And as you know, David has a strong acting career, and... and so that's, that's pretty famous, I would say. Our Teresa Herrick. Teresa has a cat named Jaws who loves to make Zoom cameos. So we'll see if maybe Jaws makes a cameo later on during the staff awards. Teresa, in the spirit of being a research administrator, designed a playground and wrote a grant to fund it. Um, as a, a, a 
Tribute to her patients, Teresa once traveled to China and Hong Kong with 39 undergraduates. So that's, that's very impressive. Teresa was also a, a member of the Reserve Officers Training Corps, or ROTC, and she can repel buildings and tear down a rifle. And I would imagine that if she demonstrated those skills to those undergraduates, that's probably a way to keep them in line. Our next awardee is Jane Sierra. Jane loves fantasy books and was first introduced to the genre as a preteen with the Dragon Riders of Pern series. Uh, Jane had a short stint in amateur boxing until her nose was broken in a fight. I, I've had a broken nose before and I can imagine that that would put you on the sideline and maybe make you reconsider. And Jane's COVID stress relief involves making masks and crocheting. And our final awardee, Michael Hess, uh, Michael likes to travel and has flown in a plane all by himself. Um, Michael provides technical expertise to uh, the School of Information as well as Michigan Medicine, and he has helped to build and maintain 20 different research projects across campus. So that's all I have for the professional development update and as well as uh, some information about our awardees. I'll turn it back over to Kathy Leibowitz now. Thanks, Chris. And most of all, thank you for joining us at RAN. Um, thank you to our guest MCs, our presenters, and everyone. Please look for a follow-up survey to let us know how we're doing and what you want to see at RAN in the future. We want and need your feedback and input for our future meetings. And thanks in advance for responding to that survey. Your voice does matter to us, and we really want to hear it. As Chris mentioned, if you haven't yet, check out the Research Administrator Forum on Workplace and um, stick around and help us celebrate our colleagues with the U of M Office of Research Staff Recognition Award Ceremony. It'll begin after a brief intermission, so stay tuned. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm hoping people can hear me okay. I'm Rebecca Cunningham, the VPR, and I really want to welcome you to our 19th Annual Research Staff Recognition Awards. It's my pleasure today to host this annual event. It is such a great occasion for us all to recognize the exceptional work that often takes place behind the scenes. The University of Michigan consistently ranks among the world's leading public universities, but I know and I know you know that the health of our research enterprise is a reflection of talented staff members across the three campuses who support our research enterprise. It takes plenty of hard work and dedication along with a high level of knowledge, skill, flexibility, and cooperation to produce research of our magnitude. In this time of COVID more than ever, the contributions and the flexibility of our staff and you are what keep us going and our enterprise strong. In a moment, we'll get to our awards, but I wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of our staff for the tremendous contributions in this time of constant change with the unknowns of COVID all around us. It's a disconcerting time and uh, our staff have, have been the backbone to help us manage. But today I'm here, since 2001, the Office of the Vice President of Research has recognized individuals across our three campuses for outstanding support of catalyzing, supporting and safeguarding U of M research. Today's recipients have demonstrated extraordinary spirit, energy, and effectiveness in their career, which has helped to keep the university's research engine running smoothly. Before I introduce this year's recipients, I'd like to thank those individuals who assisted with the selection process. Nicholas Pryor, Terry Maxwell, Chuck Woolley, Melissa, Melissa Carby, Linda Chadwick, Rick Brandon, Tom Bray, Judy Carillo, and Lori Duramity. They are all prior recipients of the Research Staff Award, so let's give them a big round of applause. Now, meet this year's honorees. If you would like to view our event program, the link is provided in the chat. The Exceptional Service Award recognizes staff members and units reporting to the Office of the Vice President of Research for important contributions to the university's research mission through exceptional performances and by going beyond the ordinary fulfillment of position duties. This year, although I regret that we are not all in person, 
I am so pleased to honor David Mulder, the International Security and Compliance Program Manager in the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects. David joined the university in 1999 and has supported U of M faculty in a variety of capacities over the past two decades. While leading the university's Navigate professional development program, David helped to plan, create, and implement research administration, training for more than 1,200 individuals across campus. In his new role, David works to ensure full compliance with federal regulations and guidelines as they relate to international engagement. Thank you, David, for your stellar customer service for over two decades. Let's all give David a big round of applause. David? Thank you, Dr. Ham. Um, I just want to say thank you really quickly to uh, Craig Reynolds and Debbie Talley for their constant support uh, of the Navigate program and their role as the program sponsors. Um, also, the members of the Navigate team, Raquel de Paula Silvius, Lynn Fife, and Laura Coddington, for all of their hard work. Um, Judy Carrillo, as the chair of the uh, RAC training subcommittee, has been just about the best chair you could ever ask for. Um, but most importantly, I want to thank all of the 100 plus volunteers from Ann Arbor, Dearborn, Flint, the schools, colleges, and units, um, the central offices, all of you who have contributed so much over the past years to make the Navigate training program successful. Um, I truly believe that uh, U of M are the leaders and best when it comes to our internal training for research administrators. And that's because of all of the hard work that you have provided over the years. So, but I'm happy to take the credit for it. So thank you. Thanks, David. And in some future year, we'll, we'll raise a glass to you together, but congratulations today. Our next award, the Research Administrator Recognition Award, recognizes research administrators in a unit across U of M and honors exemplary service to the research community over a number of years. This year, we're pleased to recognize two outstanding administrators for this award. First, we honor Teresa Herrick, the Research Process Senior Manager at the School for Environment and Sustainability with the Research Administrator Recognition Award. Teresa has supported U of M faculty for 18 years and the past 11 focused on research administration. Teresa plays a critical role in strengthening the school's research operations, which, gives, which involves managing two large center grants from the Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research and a collaborative science program from the National Estuarine Research Reserves. I think I got that right. Teresa represents small schools and colleges in the Research Administration Advisory Council Executive Committee and the Research Administration Schools Committee, as well as being a member of the Research Administration Advisory Council Committee at the Large and Process Subcommittee. That is a lot of surface that we are most appreciative for. She submitted 67 proposals on the ha behalf of C's faculty during fiscal year 2019 alone which led to many innovative research projects that focus on protecting Earth's resources and achieving a sustainable society. Let's all give Teresa a big round of applause. Teresa. Thank you, Vice President Cunningham. Um, and thank you to the committee for recommending me for this award. Um, the group that nominated me kept it very quiet and I was pretty shocked when I got the news. So thank you all. Um, anybody who knows me very well knows that I get really anxious when I speak in front of a crowd. I'm not sure that this Zoom meeting makes it any easier, but I'm going to try to get through this. Um, I did write it down because I figured I'd forget all of it otherwise. Um, I get to work with dedicated, really talented people every single day. RAs, staff, faculty, and students. And I feel like being an RA is part of making a difference through research. And that's especially true at SEAS where so much is directed towards saving our environment and working towards social justice. When I think of all the important research I've been able to support, like keeping the Great Lakes healthy, how alternative energy sources can be better utilized or how the ACA affects healthcare in Michigan, I feel like the research we do here makes a difference for real people. It's not just academic. There are so many people that I need to thank. I could probably name them for an hour and I'd still forget people. 
You have all been incredibly generous with your time and your knowledge. Even when I have asked what are sometimes really dumb questions, um, someday I'd like to know about a hundredth of what you all know. And I do need to thank our fantastic team at SEAS, Lee Young, Scott Culver, Vicki Simon, Linda DeLuca, and especially my manager, Shelly Baskowski. Thank you for everything you do, and you do a lot. SEAS is a better place because you're there. I'm not really good at work-life balance, um, so I want to thank the people who helped me find what balance I do have, um, my three daughters, Elizabeth, Etienne, and Alexandra. They're the ones who regularly remind me not to work so much. <clears throat> thank you for reminding me about my priorities. And so in closing, thank you again. I am extremely honored to be receiving this award. Thank you, Teresa. And I think that was an awesome speech. So I, I think you have to not get rid of that whole, uh, I don't do public speeches thing right away. Next, we will honor Jane Sierra, the Associate Director for Pre-Award Research Administration in the Medical School, also with the Research Administration Recognition Award. For 19 years, Jane has supported U of M faculty in research administration roles within the Medical School Dean's Office. She has directed oversight of the school's grant proposal reviews for all sponsors and grant submissions to the National Institutes of Health, the largest external sponsor of U of M research. Jane also leads the administrative accountability for nearly 50% of the proposals on campus and a direct submission of more than 1,000 per year to sponsors. Wow. Let's all please give Jane a huge round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Um, it's really an honor to receive this award. Um, I worked with a lot of you over the years, um, a lot of people in the medical school, in other schools and colleges, OB, uh, OBPR and, and ORSP. Um, in working with you, I'm always um, pleased at just how much people are willing to share ideas, um, collaborate and support each other so that we can give the best um, support to our faculty. Um, it's really been a pleasure in learning. Of course, um, my, my jump in almost 20 years ago um, has started with Heather Offhouse, my mentor, and um, she's brought me through all these years um, teaching me continually. Um, again, I, I really appreciate this um, award and um, look forward to continue working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Our third award, the Research Technical Staff Recognition Award, which is in its fourth year, recognizes staff members who have independently or along with faculty advanced the research mission of his or her unit in a way that extends beyond the ordinary fulfillment of a physician's duties. This year, we're pleased to honor Michael Hess, a solution architect lead and adjunct lecturer in the School of Information and an app programmer analyst lead for the medical school with this award. Michael has supported U of M faculty for more than 15 years. He leads teams that provide technical expertise to six research projects in Michigan Medicine and the School of Information. He supports technical systems for the School of Information, teaches four classes and builds and maintains the secure hosting for over 400 university websites for a variety of units. He's a member of the Drupal Security Working Group and also builds and maintains 20 different research projects across campus. In addition, he serves as an escalation point for technical issues web platforms that serve the research and educational goals of Michigan Medicine. And we all know that escalation point is where things get difficult. The easy questions don't come to you. So thank you so much and congratulations. Uh, thank you. Um, when uh somebody reached out to me and said i should make some remarks i'm like i don't i don't want to make remarks what am i going to say i don't like to speak and they you know i, I was reminded that i teach classes and so i kind of don't have a choice i get to speak a lot um i don't want to thank a bunch of people because i've been here for 15 years and that list is far too long uh you know the university of michigan is an amazing place um we enable people here to do life-changing research and that changes the world around us. And to be part of that is absolutely amazing. To think that, you know, the task that I'm doing now from home, but 
previously from the office, um, can impact COVID treatment, not just in the state of Michigan, but you know, worldwide is amazing. Um, and so I wanna thank the university as a whole for that opportunity and the hundreds of people who I've worked with along the way. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm struck by what a humble group this is and also by how critical the work that you're doing is part of, uh, is a, a critical part of the bigger work that we're all uh, kind of on the same ship together on. Uh, and that without the work that you're doing, often, uh, often I, I know late and, and hours and, and on your own, um, simply would, would not make the machine move ahead uh, without you. I just can't thank you enough. I wanna thank all of our participants today for joining us virtually. Um, someday we'll, we'll get to be together uh, again. Um, but in the meantime, we simply couldn't let the year go by without recognizing the outstanding service of these four individuals. I also really wanna thank Wendy Mole for organizing the event today and Jessica Durkin for coordinating the selection process. So thank you to both of them. So thank you all and I hope you enjoy your afternoon and your evening. Go blue. <laughs>